Greetings and welcome. We are in junior English, and our objective now for the hour is to turn to a really amazing and fascinating person, Phyllis Wheatley. I'm with you in your hymnals on 122, 123, and our project now for the hour is to spend a little time taking a look at a text that was written by Phyllis Wheatley. You can see your date, 1753. Do you see them at the top of 123 to 1784? I'd write that down in the login information. But why? Because it's interesting. If you've been spending any time with me in junior English, you know that we have read very few female voices. We've been spending all of our time with male voices. Guys are the ones always doing all the writing, it seems like, in our junior textbook. And finally we get to a woman, and look on page 123, a couple of really interesting things in an era. Are you reading it with me? I hope you are on 123. In an era when few women and even fewer... Whoa, what was the word you just read? I hope you write it down. It is the word slaves. Could read and write Phyllis Wheatley a... Uh, there it is. That's something we definitely want to write down. We are not just reading a woman. We're not just reading a black woman. We're reading a woman who was at one time a slave. That's a big deal. Why? Because slaves weren't supposed to be allowed to read or write. Why? Why weren't slaves allowed to read or write? What was up with that? Yeah, it's a lot easier to control people when they can't read or write. Yeah? Take a look. A female slave became one of the finest American poets of her day. West African native Wheatley brought to America on a slave ship when she's about eight. You think you got issues. Woo. Eight years old. Load her up on a boat and bring her across the Atlantic on that nasty trip. Imagine that. Right? Keep going. She was lucky enough to be purchased by a Boston family, valued her intelligence, taught her to read and write. The Wheatleys converted their young slave to Christianity, gave her the Bible, Latin, Greek classics, contemporary English poetry to read. Soon she was writing her own verse, publishing her first poem when she was just, there you go, 13. What an amazing story. So she comes over on a boat at the age of eight. One or two of our students saying, yeah, I got jacked up a little when I was eight years old. Not that jacked up, though. Whoa. And yet by 13, she's overcome all kinds of obstacles and published her first poem at the age of 13. Whoa. Notice, we're not done. 1770, you want to write that date down. She won fame through a poem about the death of a celebrated English clergyman, George Whitehead. Three years later, two British aristocrats helped her publish a volume of poetry in London. Freed from slavery in 1773. I've skipped down a few lines. Are you reading it with me? Final years filled with hardship and sorrow. Whoa! This is a woman whose life was greatly tra uh, troubled. Take a look. Three of her children die in infancy. Her husband was imprisoned for debt. Though she assembled a second collection of poetry, the manuscript was lost before publishing. She fell into obscurity as a poet, and in the century since her death, finally we're beginning to rediscover this amazing poet. She's now seen as a noteworthy poet of early America and the first writer of African origin to gain a voice in American literature. Boy, I hope you wrote down in your notes that observation. We're going to talk Langston Hughes. We're going to talk all of these amazing African American or uh, black uh, American writers. Right? Phyllis Wheatley will be the one that starts it for us. Amazing, amazing person. Now, what's going on? We're going to take a look at a poem called To His Excellency, George Washington. I'm with you now on page 125. Page 125, all right? There's a bit of background here, all right? In the early days of the American Revolution, Wheatley wrote a poem addressed to the commander of the American forces, George Washington. She sent him the poem. Uh-oh, we want to write this down. October 1775. Now, if we know anything, right, about American history, we know those famous words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, to secure these rights, governments instituted among men. What document am I quoting? The Declaration, right, the Declaration of Independence. What year? See, we qualify that year as the beginning of the American country, 
We celebrate it with hot dogs on a special day in July. Namely what? July the... Right? What year was that, Doc? 1776. Tom Jefferson and his pals write that, those famous words. Notice your date here. October of 1775. So you can do the quick mathematics. So from October 1775 to July the 4th, 1776, right? When America finally becomes the country that she is ultimately going to become in 1775, America is not yet America. Whoa, I'd write that down. In 1775, America is not yet America, right? And we've got a situation where George Washington and his troops quite possibly could lose this thing, which means what? Well, in practical matters, it means you ain't sitting here. Whoa, think about that. You're not sitting here. Hmm, keep reading. He responded with sincere thanks and expressions of admiration. He also explained the reason he did not try to publish the poem was because it praised him so highly. He was concerned he would appear vain. Whoa, 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 what does that word mean to you? Vain. Somebody says, you're so vain. It means what? Now, I know I have veins in my arm. No, 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 not the same word. To say about someone that he or she is vain means conceited. Like one of these. I'm better than you kind of thing. That means vain. Are you ready for this? George Washington, one of the greatest Americans to ever live, didn't want to appear great. I'd write that down. That's fascinating. For whatever reason, he didn't want to appear like he was conceited or vain. And so a poem about him that is going to make him look good, he was inclined to say, I don't want to publish it. Okay. Now what do we know about George Washington? Are you ready for this? Very little. He was a very private man. But we know that he was a man of tremendous energy, and he was a man who is going to enjoy silence. He liked silence. He was a quiet man, strong man, a fighter. But a lot of what we know about him is celebrated in little stories or in poems like this one here. Now, we're about to look at this poem. Go ahead and flip back to page 122. We're going to point out under our literary analysis topics at 2B that we're going to be working with what we call heroic couplets. Couplets simply meaning two, all right? Wheatley wrote in heroic couplets, introduced into English language by, of course, the great poet Chaucer. I'd write that down. Chaucer will study in your senior year, a British, pro a, a British poet. You'll notice that there's some rhyming going on with this thing, and there's some end rhyme, okay, that goes on with this poem when we take a look at it. We also have some references to classical mythology, mythology from an earlier time, a time of the Greeks and the Romans, okay? And so as we look into this uh, poem, we're going to see some of that as well. Now let's take a look at it. We're going to be on page 125. We're going to listen to a professional reader read it. All you have to do is follow along. Our goal now is to just read the text itself. Now let me make a quick observation before we start. Follow the words with the tip of your pen. Literally, follow them. Don't write in your book. But follow the words with the tip of your pen. If you can keep up with the flow of the words, I'm with you now on page 125. You ought to be looking on page 125 right now. If you can follow the words with the tip of your pen and they make sense to you, then your reading speed is about where it needs to be. If, on the other hand, you struggle to keep up with your pen or pencil's top, then we've got to work to help you in terms of your reading speed issues, what we call fluidity, okay? So here we go. Follow along. This is the poem by Phyllis Wheatley. To His Excellency, General Washington by Phyllis Wheatley. Celestial choir enthroned in realms of light, Columbia's scenes of glorious toils I write. 
While freedom's cause her anxious breast alarms, she flashes dreadful in refulgent arms. See Mother Earth her offspring's fate bemoan, and nations gaze at scenes before unknown. See the bright beams of heaven's revolving light involved in sorrows and the veil of night. The goddess comes, she moves divinely fair. Olive and laurel binds her golden hair. Wherever shines this native of the skies, unnumbered charms and recent graces rise. Muse, bow propitious while my pen relates how poor her armies through a thousand gates. As when Eolus, heaven's fair face deforms and wrapped in tempest and a night of storms. Astonished ocean, Feels the wild uproar, the refluent surges beat the sounding shore. Or thick as leaves in autumn's golden rain, such and so many moves the warrior's train. In bright array, they seek the work of war, where high unfilled the ensign waves in air. Shall I to Washington their praise recite? Enough thou knowest them in the fields of fight. The first in peace and honors we demand the grace and glory of thy martial band. Famed for thy valor, for thy virtues more, hear every tongue thy guardian aid implore. One century scarce performed its destined round when Gallic powers Columbia's fury found. And so may you, whoever dares disgrace the land of freedom's heaven-defended race. Fixed are the eyes of nations on the scales, for in their hopes Columbia's arm prevails anon. Britannia droops the pensive head, while round increase the rising hills of dead. Ah, cruel blindness to Columbia's state. Lament thy thirst of boundless power too late. Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action let the goddess guide. A crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine with gold unfading, Washington be thine! Now, I want you to just jot down your first kind of feelings about not the poem, but this woman reading the poem. What, what is the first thing you would say? I mean, if you, for example, walked out of here and somebody said, dude, what you do in 303? And you say, we did this poem uh, to George Washington by this woman named Phyllis Wheatley. Um, what was it about? Well, I, I don't know, man, but I know the person who read this poem. What would you say? Go ahead and jot down. What would you say? What's one thing you would say about the way she read this poem? Sometimes students will say things like, dude, she's like totally into this. She seems very excited. You know what I'm saying? It's like she's not ready to go to sleep right now. She's really jacked up excited about reading this poem. Why? Because this is a poem that is to be read with, are you ready for the word, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. What does that word mean? Excitement. Joy even, we might say. Now, there's a couple of things here right away we want to point out for your notes. So let's work at level one, shall we? Just really quickly and at level two, A. The poem, first of all, it does two things. One, it glorifies or celebrates the revolution. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Revolution? What does that mean? To revolt. Somebody were to stand up, for example, right now in class and say, dude, I ain't doing this no more. I'm out of here. That's called revolt. That's called a revolution. Another word, of course, for revolution is a fight. Right? I'm going to fight against the power. What is the revolution that is occurring in October 1775? Well, that's why you come to high school and you take a history class where they will tell you that before America was America, it was actually England. England. British. Right? And people who lived in what today we call America 
claimed allegiance to England. But for any number of reasons, the people living in the colonies, colonialists, said to England, no more. They declared their independence a few months after this poem was sent to George Washington. George Washington was the general leading the troops against the English. All right? Things were not going well at different points in 1775. There was great fear that George Washington and his troops would be defeated. There were a lot of people that said, this is a really stupid thing to have this fight with England. They're a lot more powerful than us. Let's just go ahead and give them what they want. Washington and the others said, no. So in this poem, the first thing is celebrating the colonialists and their revolution. And the way that Wheatley does it is through the goddess, you want to write this down, Columbia. Columbia. Now, of course, who is this goddess, Columbia? All right. Columbia as the daughter of Mother Earth sympathizes with her daughter as she faces her enemies. We call the city of our capital of our nation Washington, D.C. Whoa, 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 wait. Washington, named after General Washington, the one who led the troops to victory and served as our first president in our new country. But what does D? C stand for? Well, that's an interesting question. It actually means District of Columbia. District? Yeah, it's not a state. It's not a state like Wyoming. It's not a state like New Hampshire. It's a district named after Columbia. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, what is this Columbia thing all about? We're referencing classic mythology here with Columbia, okay? A goddess. So the first thing that is going to happen in this poem is there's going to be a celebration. Look at the opening lines on 125. Celestial choir enthroned in realms of light. Columbia's scenes of glorious toils I write. She's going to write a poem about toil, struggle fight. We might say challenges. I'd write all those kinds of words down. This is a celebration of the fight. Okay. Now, we could quickly jump to 3B real quickly. And we could ask you to write down, what is the biggest fight you ever had in your life? Go ahead and write it down real quick at 3B. What is for you the biggest fight you ever had? Yeah, I say biggest. It might be the best. It might be the worst. It might be the one where the worst things happen to you. What's a, what, what is the best fight you ever had? Some of you might say it happened in a great video contest game or something like that. Whatever it is for you. Some of you are athletes will say, best contest was when I was involved in a ball game. Some of you will say, it was the fight that I had in my own house. My struggle for myself. My struggle for my independence. Whatever that was. What is for you the fight? The toil? Okay. That's a 3B question. You can jot that one down. Some of you will reference other revolutions. Other times people stood up and fought for what they thought was right so that they could have freedom. Right? So they could have freedom. There are several interesting things here. I'm going to just jump to lines 13, 14, and 15. Muse... Bow, propitious while my pen relates how poor her armies through a thousand gates as when Elias's heavens fair face deforms and wrapped in tempest in a night of storms. And readers of this poem would say, whoa, 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 what is this with this muse stuff and Elias? And of course, your, your footnote at the very bottom says that Elias was a Greek god of the winds. Um, can we just say this for your notes? Wheatley is showing off a bit. She is saying to her white readers who say, 
black people are stupid because they're uneducated. People who aren't white are dumb because they can't read or write. Wheatley goes, really? Are you at all familiar with the works of Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey? Because she says, I am. Only notice she doesn't say, I'm well read. She just simply quotes things from classical mythology and she expects the readers to know what she's talking about. Pretty smart, pretty savvy, isn't she? That is to say, she's going to show that she's been educated. She isn't just a slave at all. Can you jot down at 2A, why would she do that? Why would she show white readers that she's no idiot? Got down a note on that one. Why would she do that? It's kind of like somebody that tries to make fun of you because of your skin color or because of your money situation or because of the neighborhood you live in or because of the city or the state where you live and somebody starts making fun of you and instead of coming right back at them and giving it back to them, you instead show them they're wrong. Right? For example, she proves, I've been educated. Are you ready for this? Better than most white readers of her day. Hmm, very interesting. Notice she calls it at the bottom of page 125 at line, one, at line 21, the work of war. The work of war. You see it at the bottom of page 125 there, line 20, 122. The work of of war, right? Jot down at 2A, why do you think sometimes war is work? What kind of work? What kind of challenge? What would it be for you to have to be in a war? What would that be like? 